Hey everyone, and welcome to uh, this year's Early Career Faculty Professional Development Session. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, although I'm guessing that some people are going to keep uh, trickling in since I know that the uh, keynote just ended. So I'm Jessica Allen, an assistant professor at West Virginia University, and if you want to uh, put a face to the name, I'm the one who's been um, emailing you recently with details about the session. And so this session was organized by myself and Jennifer Nichols from the University of Florida, who will be, you'll be hearing from soon. It's one of the initiatives of our Early Career Faculty Affinity Group. Our theme this year is Tips and Tricks for Research Productivity, and we have an awesome pair of speakers to kick off this session uh, to give us tips and tricks for um, research productivity at both uh, research and teaching intensive uh, positions. Um, I want to thank both of our speakers as well as our, I believe we have over 20 leaders in biomechanics that are going to be serving as mentors in our breakout rooms. I think I can speak for everyone else um, that we really appreciate the time that you've taken to join us today uh, and your willingness to help us out as well as all of your amazing joking about um, in the chat. Everyone, please, please see how our mentors and, and mentees are already uh, uh, working together uh, to have a fun session. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let Jen take over for now because uh, I'm in charge of making sure our breakout rooms are set up by the time we're ready. Um, so Jen, you can go ahead and take over now. Yeah, so I'm just going to steal about two minutes of everyone's time to make sure um, you know what our group is. So we're the ASB Early Career um, Faculty um, Initiative slash Affinity Group. And we have a leadership committee of approximately 12 early career faculty that work together in order to organize our events. So I wanna give all of them a shout out because they do things throughout the year that you don't get to see. Um, and I also wanna give a special shout out to the four highlighted in blue who just joined our leadership team and will be taking on responsibilities throughout the year. For those of you who don't know, we have lots of ongoing activities. So we host monthly events uh, which includes networking for our early career faculty, informal discussions with the ASB fellows, which we really appreciate their continued support. And we've also been um, working on getting professional development workshops up and running. So for any of you that are um, more senior faculty, if you have a professional development topic that is near and dear to your heart, please reach out. We're happy to host you um, at a month, kind of according to your schedules um, to come and chat with faculty members. We'll host, we host conference events like this, writing groups in order to provide peer support for grants and journal papers, which are important to all of us. Um, we've also been working with the um, student reps to do a speaker series on what it means in early career faculty life. And then I want to also particularly highlight our mentoring program, which we will help facilitate if you're an early career faculty member and you're like, I'm the only biomechanist at my institution and I don't know how to find people. Um, we will help facilitate getting you a senior mentor in your field with interests aligned with you if you kind of can't bridge that those barriers. So please feel free to reach out um, on those topics. Now, so that everyone's on the same page regarding what's actually happening today, this is our agenda. So I have approximately one more minute to wrap up. Then we're going to have about 15 to 20 minutes where Dr. Bigelow and Dr. Ferris are going to give us tips and tricks for research productivity. And then we're hoping for at least 30, um, up to 40 minutes of roundtable discussions. You will get a warning um, when that um, happens and we're gonna break out into kind of based on the types of institutions you're at. So with that, I'm <coughs> going to turn um, the screen over to Dr. Ferris. Okay, Jen, can you see my slides now? Looks good. Okay, so I, number one rule outside of this, I would say never follow David Who. Um, that's probably a hard thing to match, Wombat Who. But I also want to thank uh, my co-speaker, Kim, for letting me go number one. Uh, so first off, uh, with uh, sincere apologies to David Letterman, I'm going to give you my top 10 tips and tricks for research productivity with the idea that I'm talking from a research uh, intensive university standpoint. So number 10, do <laughs> not try to be a copy of your PhD advisor or postdoc advisor. You don't wanna compete with somebody who's senior, who's had success, who's already established in the field, because when it comes time for your grants to be reviewed, if they see it as, um, 
a copy of good things that are already going on in another lab that you came from, they're going to question how, uh, how original they are and how much the ideas are your own. So don't do that. Number nine, do, don't jump on the bandwagon of research topics. Choose your own path. So do your best to really think about how do I make myself unique and different from the other people that are out there. Uh, the biggest uh, error that I see in a lot of junior faculty applications that are coming into the study section that I serve on is that we will get 10 or 15 applications all in a very similar area coming up with a new approach for training stroke or older subjects to prevent falls. And if you're going to be very similar to what everybody else is doing and your efficacy rate is about the same, you're not going to distinguish yourself. You really need to come up with a novel path that lets you really make an impact. If you choose something else that nobody else is working on, immediately you're the world's best at it. And I think that's really strong um, advice when you think about competing with all these other applications. There's way too much good science coming to NIH and NSF study sections. And if you're going to have to distinguish which one gets funded and what doesn't, two projects that are similar quality, but one is very different than the others is going to get funded. Number eight, find good people to work with and encourage them. Um, if you saw Karen Troy's uh, Founders Award presentation, she made a strong point about, you know, inviting good people to come into the lab and encouraging them and say, if you make me look good, I'll make you look good. That's a really important point. When you're starting out a lab, good students, good postdocs, good um, research staff can make the path forward for the lab so much easier. And on the flip side of that is a unmotivated or a bad fit for the lab, somebody that's really not interested in the research of the lab is going to drag the lab down. You need to find good people that you can coalesce with, that you have inter interactions with that are positive, both um, from a research standpoint and from a communication standpoint, and do your best to encourage them. Number seven. Uh, money in your startup account doesn't count towards tenure decisions. A lot of junior faculty have a hard time spending money. They think, oh, I may need this later. I may want to do this. Oh, I got, I wanted to take on one PhD student my first year, but I got three really good students. How do I decide? Um, my advice is you have to spend your money to be productive. Uh, Karen Troy also touched on this with a really uh, different quote, same take. Uh, but she quoted one of her mentors, money is like manure. It sits in a pile and stinks, spread it around, and it makes things grow. Um, same general idea is you're, you're not going to get tenure with a bunch of money from your startup account in your, in your bank account. You really got to buy equipment and spend it on students. Number six, find more than one mentor. You may have the best mentor in the world right in your department that's very helpful and has good suggestions. But having more than one mentor gives you different perspectives. They may have a different set of experiences that may come in handy that uh, will give you advice that you didn't hear from that one mentor. It's really important to have multiple people to talk to on a regular basis. Number five, have multiple people critique your proposals before submitting them. Think of it this way. If you could do your own little study section and have multiple people give you feedback on a proposal before you ever submit it to NIH for review, you're going to have a step up compared to a lot of the other proposals that come in. Find all the things that um, are not obvious to a naive reader, but are obvious to you. What are you not selling? What are you not explaining well enough? Getting a fresh set of eyes to uh, provide you feedback is a great way to do that. Number four, hire a part-time or full-time lab manager if possible. So out of my startup package, I really pushed for them providing at least a 20-hour week hourly employee to um, keep all the lab equipment running, to teach undergrads and grad students how to use lab equipment, to order supplies, to help out with IRBs. All of those things are super valuable. And a lot of times your fresh graduate student that is just coming out of an undergrad degree may not have experience with. And if you're gonna to have to devote 
some of your time to ordering supplies, setting up equipment, teaching people how to use it, that's less time that you're gonna spend on thinking about research, writing grant proposals, writing papers for publication, um, and going to conferences. So you really need to use uh, whatever talents you can find. And if you spend money for a lab manager, it's totally worth it. One of the things about academia is balance is always dynamic. It is not a static situation. You're not trying to balance the time between teaching and research and meeting with your grad students and doing service in a way that's ever at a constant uh, steady state situation. Everything is about adjustment. You may spend more time this week on setting up those initial two or three weeks of lectures in your class. And then the second week you spend more time on writing that grant proposal that's coming due. Those are just examples. You're gonna be continually shifting your attention and your workflow. It's never gonna be at a steady state. Accept that and uh, you know, if there's a week that you wanna spend at the beach with your family, that's one of the nice things about academia is you have the flexibility in a lot of situations to spend that four day weekend. Use your flexibility to maintain balance, but in a dynamic way. Number two, be choosy when it comes to research projects. Um, so I grabbed this little cartoon of a person going up to a buffet uh, and thinking about how I can totally destroy everything, all the food that's in that buffet. In the same way as a new assistant professor, when you set up your lab, there's so many good research projects you could do. Um, another common error that I see is that you either try too many projects or that you're not being as discriminating about which projects to pursue. Think about which ones are really gonna have the most impact. If you're gonna find a difference that's small in terms of the clinical significance or small in terms of the effect size, but it's there. Yeah, it may be good science, but it's not going to help you make a name for yourself. It's not going to help you get that grant proposal when there's five times as many good research projects that are out there that we can't fund. And then lastly, being an academic is really part of your life. It's not your whole life. Um, that's really hard to keep in perspective as a beginning faculty member because you have so many um, so much passion about what you're trying to do and you're setting up your lab and you want to be successful. But if you don't spend time to take care of your health, maintain your hobbies, have your friends and family interactions, then you're, you're going to be in a worse situation when you are working on your job. It's just part of your life, not everything. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Kim. Thanks, Dan. Share my screen and we'll keep the, the top 10 tips going from the research perspective. All right, so um, continuing along top 10 tips, except this one's kind of the teaching focused institution edition. So I'm at the University of Dayton, which um, we do have masters and uh, doctoral students in at least the mechanical engineering program, but we're certainly a, a teaching heavy inst institution. And so I wanted to bring up some of the unique points um, that may apply to those of you in the same situation. Number 10, make time for research because teaching could be a full-time job. You may be teaching three or four courses a semester. And I have um, seen just so many people pour all of their time and energy into setting up their courses and saying, well, next year, once I'm past my first year, once I'm past my second year, I'll start doing the research. And I think it's really important from day one to start doing research, whatever research looks like at your institution and for you. And then um, another thing I found important, especially at a teaching institution, number nine, sometimes you need to make yourself inaccessible to others. And obviously um, that, that goes for all of us, but at a teaching institution, you may have um, policies or expectations about open door office hours and just being very approachable to students. If you're in your office, be ready for, for oh, interruption. And so um, for me, I was, I was fortunate in my labs actually in a different building. And so I very purposely said, I'm not teaching any Fridays and every Friday I'm there. And so even if it's one day a week or afternoons or whatever you need to do, I'm carving out that time away from your teaching tasks to do that. And then at our institution, um, we have kind of a neat program called Writing with Friends, which is essentially locking yourself in the library 
and it's at the end of each semester for three full days in a row and then um, every month for three hours one day of the, of the month in the evening and it's um fortunately formally structured here but something you could certainly do with with other early career faculty in your home institution where it's just easier to to all go and know that from 6 to 9 p.m. on that Wednesday, you're going to be working on the manuscript or whatever else in a very uh, dedicated environment to do that. Number eight, find the right collaborators. And I found a lot of success doing that both internally. I think that's important, especially if um, you may be the only biomechanist at, at your home institution. Um, looking to the stats department, looking to the psychology department, looking to the physical therapy department. What resources do you have internally? Because that will be helpful but also um, certainly external to find the rest of the biomechanics world. If you're alone, there, there's other places um, you can look and, and have some really nice collaborations that way. Number seven though, the opposite, don't be afraid to back away from collaborations and projects that aren't working. And I, and I think um, I found this very much when I started here, I was the first biomechanist hired. No one really knew what biomechanics was. And so all of um, the faculty in my department wanted to help me and they would say, well, I know someone who's doing something with this and it was the body, but it wasn't anything that I was doing. And, you know, for a while I was, oh, I'll at least meet with them. I'll, you know, I'll look for opportunity, but it was really important to realize you still wanted to maintain your path forward and that not all collaborations would be good collaborations and not all projects would be um, good uh, projects and often there's not a medical school associated with a teaching institution and so some projects um, just don't have the population that you need and it took me a little while to figure out who we could easily recruit from the Dayton area and who we couldn't and and that helped um, decide where to, to spend your effort. Number six, um, this is kind of the, the recap of um, uh, Tuesday's tutorial on undergraduate uh, research. And so what I shared there was, you know, it's important to engage undergraduate research in a mutually beneficial way. And they can be very important in helping you develop your lab and get things going. I've had a huge success with my undergraduate research team. I normally have anywhere between 10 and 40 undergrads in a semester and then one or two master students and occasionally a PhD student. So here were um, the couple tips that I shared there. Uh, at the tutorial on Tuesday. One, set expectations early. Having a research and communication agreement with the students is really important, especially undergrads. Sometimes um, feels okay to, you know, skip coming to lab because they have to study for a test or something like that. So those expectations and that agreement or contract is very powerful. Making sure that uh, you empower your most promising students and let them lead. I've had a sophomore undergrad lab director um, wouldn't think that uh, maybe a sophomore could, could really lead the group in as effective as a way that she, she did, um, but she was, was fabulous, helped me get my lab started, and then um, ultimately won a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. Uh, number three, some projects are better than other projects for undergrads. Make sure that you're thinking about that and know that sometimes that's a new IRB so that your undergrads can be doing something that is more preliminary or pilot, but, but helping you advance your, your research agenda. Um, also, undergrad research experiences don't have to be exclusively traditional lab-based, so uh, or lab-based research. So if you have um, involvement in National Biomechanics Day or outreach, have your undergrads get involved in, in leading and then potentially assessing that as well. But the biggest thing about involving undergrads is really being careful about that handoff from semester to semester because there is often a lot of transition. So I have my students write kind of a letter to the next researcher, whoever picks up this project would be able to um, know exactly where you ended it, exactly what they know uh, they need, where the files are and, and everything else. So that letter has been very important. Number five, take advantage of internal and smaller funding sources, use them to lead to something bigger. I found a lot of institutions like mine have um, different funds on campus, some for students, some for faculty, um, some are research for students. Use those, look in the local community. So I was connected with our hospital system who um, offered some foundational funding. And then ultimately that led to the NIH and NSF um, proposals, um, but certainly was, was useful to start small with what I had available to me as I was getting started. Number four, look for opportunities to blend your research, teaching and service maybe more than you even would um, for, for all of us. And so what that, that meant or looked like to me 
was um, I was able to get both a NSF grant and then later an NIH grant to do assistive device design in my classrooms. And so it was uh, kind of a, a line of, of biomechanics work that, that I might do, but rather than do it in my class, I was able to maximize um, the classroom environment, get all the students uh, involved in, in a taste of biomechanics and get some federal funding to do that to add to my uh, promotion tenure package. And then also along with that, um, publishing on that work. And so um, doing some scholarship about the classroom experience helped add to my portfolio. Um, and that leads us to number three, con consider conducting in some, I would not say all, uh, research and, and publishing on it in the scholarship of teaching and learning in biomechanics. Especially if you're an un at an undergraduate only institution, this can be really powerful. You're probably still teaching biomechanics courses. So assessing you know, pre and post learning and, and outcomes and other things like that can help add publications in the field of biomechanics beyond your technical research. And for me, it was important, you know, it was every for every three or four papers that were my technical line of research, maybe I was looking at one conference paper or publication related to the teaching and learning of biomechanics. Number two, this one um, was, was critical for me, and I think we all feel this a lot and are missing our in-person meetings, you know, make ASB your home and its members, your colleagues and friends, and um, having uh, others to look to for advice throughout the whole process, having people I could call up and say, I know you've got this set up in your lab. Can you tell me what you bought, how you bought it? Um, I was alone here for a long time. Now we have eight biomechanists, which is really exciting. But when I didn't have others to, to talk to, uh, the ASB community was who I turned to and they really helped pave the way. And it, it's been a while, but um, we sometimes do quick studies um, that you can apply for um, So at the, the ASB meeting. Uh, a research team could lead a very quick kind of study. And so I had the, the fortune to participate um, in, in conducting one of those a couple years ago. And it was a great way I worked with um, another lab group. We all set up, had our students get to know each other and within one week of ASB collected 70 some people's worth of data and, and got a, a paper and some publications out of that. And then finally, um, you know, just strive to be the best mentor you can be. I think that this is really important. You wear a lot of hats as a faculty member, um, but when you're the best mentor you can be, you really empower your students. And I found that that students who, who feel you care, who feel that you've um, been open to listening to them and giving them some freedom, they will often exceed your expectations. So there was an excellent talk Tuesday about uh, mentorship, and there's been lots of conversations about mentorship, but really students will rise to the occasion and exceed your expectations. Um, and that's been what I found here and critical to my success. With that, I'll turn it back to Jen. Thank you. Um, and thanks for all that fantastic advice um, from both of those talks. It's great to see that you've already generated quite a bit of discussion in the chat, which gives me hope that the breakout rooms will be really rewarding.